All right, so uh, the focus of my talk today is security of data in transit. And in modern applications, data rarely flows over a single direct point-to-point -point transport connection. Um, essentially, my, my point is that it's the, you know, even though we've been since, uh, since uh, we start learning computer science, we've been used to this picture of a client talking to, to a server over some transport connection, the reality of most real world applications is rarely uh, like this. Um, you know, if you take even the simplest uh, case, uh, like a web server or a web app, um, most likely your web app involves at least two transport layer connections. Um, so, you know, there may be a load balancer in the middle and the client is talking to the load balancer uh, over one TCP connection, and then the load balancer is talking to your actual backend server over another TCP connection. And if you're using, you know, a microservices based architecture, this may be many TCP connections or transport layer connections, right? So a client talks to an API gateway, API gateway talks to microservice one, microservice one delegates to another microservice and another microservice and so forth. So in the part of a single request response, there may be several uh, transport layer hops. And this gets complicated the more um, mature and uh, complex your infrastructure gets. If you're using something like Kubernetes, you may have a load balancer and an ingress gateway. Uh, so which just adds more transport layer connections or hops in the path of a single application layer message exchange. Uh, you may have a message broker uh, for asynchronous communication and then the client is talking to the message broker over one transport connection and various microservices are talking to the message broker over different transport connections. And these, what's unique about message brokers because they make communication asynchronous, these transport layer connections may happen at a different point in time. Um, you may have this message broker be an external service and you know, provided by a third party. And, and so your transport connections may not even be within your data center or your cloud installation. Um, these microservices in turn may talk to other external services during the, during the application layer message exchange. Um, and as we start going away from the data center and into you know, physical environments, like let's say a, a connected factory with some kind of low power wireless area network, um, then you may even have multiple transport protocols in the path of a uh, application layer data exchange. Um, and you know, the first hop of the, the, fir the, the client sends a message and the first hop that the message takes is a um, LoRaWAN hop and the next hop is a TCP hop and then there's another TCP hop and another TCP hop, right? Um, so in this scenario, multiple transport protocols are involved. Um, and if you, um, you know, start thinking, taking this further, and as we move towards more and more computation moving to the edge, uh, like maybe in connected car-like scenarios uh, or connected factories um, or uh, smart buildings, uh, you may have um, edge compu computation available. And, you know, uh, there may be a mini version of your data center architecture running at the edge somewhere where lots of microservices are available right there and data is only selectively sent back to your data center or your cloud installation. So my point here is that, um, you know, of the, my point of showing all of these pictures and the architectures is that most modern applications rarely have like a very simple point to point transport connection as the data flow. It's not a single connection. It's often many connections, often many protocols, um, often asynchronous connections and so forth. So our focus is, um, as I started the talk, is this question of security of data in transit. And a good uh, threat model to think about security of data in transit is this stride threat model. 
it's a very high level model, but it you know it's it's still very useful and covers all the bases. Um, so um, the each letter in stride stands for a threat, and uh, in this table here, I've uh, listed out the corresponding desired properties we want from um, a a, ex a secure exchange um, of data. Uh, so we want protection against spoofing of identities. So we want to know who we're talking to, and we want protection against tampering of data, and we want to ensure data integrity. Uh, we want to, in some applications, we want to make sure that the party who originated data uh, signs it and cannot refute or uh, that data or deny sending that data. In other applications, we may want the opposite property of they do want deniability or repudiation uh, or repudiability. Um, we may want protection against information disclosure. We may want protection against, or we usually want protection against denial of service. Um, and we, of course, want pr protections against elevation of privilege. So um, we typically have some you know, typical tools in our toolbox to protect against these threats and get the desired properties that we want of um, authentication, data integrity, confidentiality, et cetera. Uh, so the first tool in our toolbox has been for the last several decades, uh, place all our trust in network boundaries. So we create these secure perimeters around our sensitive uh, infrastructure, and then we try to protect those perimeters and we try to protect those boundaries and make sure that no one can get in. We put in firewalls and, um, and other types of protections to protect us, protect our network traffic. And then within that network traffic, we kind of just trust everything, right? So if let's say we draw this boundary, then we just assume that the data integrity of a message within this boundary cannot be tampered by someone. Um, and, um, and we kind of just put, put all our effort behind the boundary uh, or could be you know, simple web app or could be an asynchronous system with, uh, with a message broker. But it turns out the learning of the security community over the last um, um, say three decades or four decades of running this network boundary infrastructure in you know by IT departments etc is that um, uh, most people are realizing that boundaries are kind of impossible to enforce in the modern environment of mobile technologies, cloud technologies, um, edge computing, et cetera. This is a paper from Google that talks about it. And if you look into that paper, they go, well, key assumptions of the perimeter security model no longer hold. The perimeter is no longer just the physical location of the enterprise. Um, access should depend solely on device and user credentials, regardless of a user's network location. Um, this has been sort of codified into books and there's a NIST paper on zero trust architecture, but uh, this zero trust network book, book by Gilliam and Barth uh, states that in a zero trust network where you're placing zero trust in the network boundaries, you, you assume that the network is always hostile. You assume that internal and external threats exist on the network at all times. Um, you, you don't use network locality as, as sufficient for deciding or trust in your data. Um, everything is authenticated and authorized and policy enforcement is granular and dynamic and based on information you have just in time. Um, even the, you know, in, in the States here, there was a national uh, cybersecurity executive order a few days ago. Even that mentions uh, the zero trust architecture and basically goes, we need to assume that threats exist inside and outside of traditional network boundaries. Uh, and we can't have implicit trust. We need to have a least, we need to apply the concept of least privileged access to every access decision. So uh, the first mechanism available to us to protect our data was network boundaries. But we've learned as a community over the last uh, you know, 30 years is that network boundaries are becoming increasingly more difficult to enforce, especially in, um, in modern applications with cloud, edge, uh, mobile devices, IoT devices, et cetera. Um, the second tool we have in our toolbox to enforce 
security or achieve all those qualities we wanted from the Stripe trust model um, is transport layer security or TLS or um, SSL, especially since Erlang calls, um, still calls uh, their the TLS implementation SSL, which is the old name of the standard. The problem with transport layer security is data within modern applications rarely flows over a single direct point-to-point -point transport connection. Why is this a problem? This is a problem because TLS is tightly coupled with the length and duration of the underlying TCP connection. Um, so technically you could separate it out and implement it, but practically speaking for all intents and purposes, uh, a TLS connection is as long as the underlying TCP connection. Um, what that means is that the data integrity and confidentiality guarantees are lost at every transport connection hop. And we looked at all those pictures in the beginning of my presentation where there are lots of transport hops in every data exchange in modern applications, which means that all at all intermediary points, the the guarantees of integrity and confidentiality and authentication provided by the secure channel layer or the transport uh, layer security layer are lost. Uh, so TLS is increasingly less useful in these types of data flows because it 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 kind of um, it, it it violates the principle of least privilege um, as highlighted by the executive order uh, a few days ago. Every program and every privileged user of a system should operate using the least amount of privilege necessary to complete a job. So a message broker whose job is to route messages between producers and consumers shouldn't get to see the data in those messages. It shouldn't get to manipulate potentially if the message broker is compromised, manipulate the data that is being exchanged between uh, producers and consumers. Um, so same, same thing is true with, you know, some kind of LoRaWAN uh, gateway or, a, a, you know, edge computing device. These network intermediaries shouldn't be able to manipulate data uh, that isn't intended for them. And they should provide, we, our application should have end-to-end -end security and privacy guarantees. To achieve this, the tool in our toolbox that we need to use is secure channels. TLS is also a secure channel protocol, uh, but it's a secure channel protocol that is tightly coupled with, um, with TCP. Secure channels is a general uh, tool, and broadly speaking, a secure channel kind of works like this. Uh, in the, there is an initiator of the channel, there is a responder of the channel, um, the initiator sends a few, uh, initiates and sends a message to the responder somehow, uh, there is exchange of a few messages, uh, typically called the handshake. Uh, this exchange usually involves public key cryptography. Um, to achieve a shared secret without sending that shared secret on the wire. So primitives like the Diffie-Hellman exchange are used to achieve a shared secret between the two parties. Um, once the two parties have a shared secret, then we use authenticated encryption or symmetric key encryption, something like AES-GCM, um, to then encrypt the data for the destination. So this is a secure channel protocol. Um, in, um, the, in the open source library Occam that I work on these days, what we've done is we've taken um, a, a secure channel implementation and we've made it available as a a Elixir library, a Rust library, and we're, pl we're planning to add other libraries in the future. So essentially you can create a secure channel by calling uh, a single line uh, function. So if you're Bob, you create a secure channel listener or you're the responder, you create a secure channel listener, you're provided with some secrets and uh, the listener sits and waits for a new incoming secure channel requests. And then if you're Alice, you know the route to Bob, and I'll elaborate on what I mean by route to Bob in a second. You know the route to Bob, and you provide your secrets to the secure channel uh, mod, uh, create function, and what you get back is a uh, secure channel uh, with Bob. 
So what's interesting about this is that this is now as easy as calling the simple function in a uh, suite of programming languages, currently Elixir and Rust, but over time, many others. Um, but to achieve this and to decouple the secure channel from the transport layer, we had to do something special. We had to implement a small, very sort of lightweight routing layer. So what do I mean by that? So if you imagine the traditional network stack of, you know, there's the IP or the internet protocol with the collection of things like the IP protocol, the ICMP protocol, et cetera. So you've got that. You've got TCP sitting on top of IP, you have TLS sitting on top of TCP, and then your application is using TLS to do secure communication. We've replaced the stack and turned it into something that looks like this. You've, you've still got your application, but instead of using TLS, the application is using Occam secure channels. Occam secure channels in turn depend on Occam routing. Um, and Occam routing can route messages over a transport like TCP. But TCP isn't the only transport uh, Occam routing could route messages over. Um, it can route over a, collect, uh, a bunch of, um, uh, a bunch of uh, IP-based uh, protocols like HTTP, WebSocket, UDP, et cetera. But it could also route on protocols that are not internet based and could be, you know, um, are internet protocol based and uh, could be a radio protocol like Bluetooth or Bluetooth LE or a LoRaWAN or LPVAN protocol like LoRaWAN or NB IoT, et cetera. Um, so what's happened here is that the secure channel implementation is now decoupled from the transport layer. And by doing that, we can have secure channels that span several hops of transport layer connections. So you can have a secure channel that is over three transport layer hops, three TCP hops, or two UDP hops, or even one TCP hop, one UDP hop, another TCP hop, or one Bluetooth hop, one TCP hop, et cetera, right? So you can have an end-to-end -end secure channel that isn't limited by the length of the underlying transport protocol connection. Um, another cool thing you get out of this is that you can have secure channels that uh, can be established with parties that may not be online. So you can have establish a secure channel with someone who is still offline, a device that is offline. Um, and you can do that because they may have some pre-shared uh, cryptographic material already uploaded to some place, or you can, as an initiator, start the, the handshake but they can at a later point in time consume the handshake. Uh, so by decoupling from the transport layer connection, uh, you are decoupled from the length of the transport connection, but also the duration of the transport connection. Uh, so you can get asynchronous uh, secure channels uh, because of certain things we've done in the, the handshake protocol implementation. All right. So, to, to look at some code examples of how this works and what this looks like, um, we'll have to take a little bit of detour and talk about routing before we establish a end-to-end -end encrypted secure channel. Um, so to demonstrate routing, I'm creating a printer worker. And a worker in the Occam system is basically a gen server or an Erlang process with a with a address that is known to the Occam routing layer. So you can have a, any number of pro Erlang processes uh, that have that register an address with the Occam routing layer um, and by just defining these Occam workers. So here we define a printer worker that simply receives a message and prints it. Um, this is how we create that printer at address printer. Um, so once the printer worker is running, we can write a Occam routing message or routable message that looks like this. It has a payload field and it has an onward route field. Um, uh, the onward route field is a list of addresses. So in, we gave our worker the address printer and we are basically here saying, send the message hello to the worker at address printer. So then we say Occam router route this message. 
and uh, our printer receives the message. And since the code of the printer was written to just print the message, it prints it. So this is a very, very hello world-ish example of the Occam routing layer working within one Erlang node. Um, but you can make this work across multiple um, nodes uh, and we call them Occam nodes because they could also technically be in other languages and they don't have to be only in um, only beam based. Um, so to, to send messages over a transport to another node, um, you need a transport connection. So here what we do is on one node, we create a TCP listener and make it listen or port 3000. And then on a different node, we create a TCP client connection and make a connection to that TCP listener on the, on the other node. And then we can define a Occam routable message that looks like this. Uh, we've got the same payload hello, but in this, this time around, we've got a route that has its first hop as a TCP address and the second hop as the worker address that is on that other node. So from node one, I make a TCP hop to the other node two. And then on node two, we have the printer worker and the message is delivered to the printer over there and then printed. To send this message, we've used the same Occam router route message call that we used before. What's interesting about this is that you can then have any number of these transport hop route, uh, hops in a route. Uh, so here I could say, hey, go to port 2000 first. And then to the node on port 2000, I go, well, no, send this message over to port 3000. And then it reaches there and then we tell that guy, no, 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 send it over to port 4000. So that part, that, so this particular message will take three transport hops and on the third node, it'll go to the local worker called printer. Um, and then the printer will print hello. Uh, what's interesting further about this is, um, is that these, these, um, these all don't have to be TCP addresses. You could also have a Bluetooth address in, in the middle of this. And it would work the same way as long as the Bluetooth transport has been written to understand um, Occam routing. Um, and these messages, when they travel over the wire, they're turned into very tiny uh, binary messages. So there's a binary encoding um, uh, that we've written that uh, takes this message and turns it into a tiny binary packet. Uh, this one most likely will be, you know, somewhere to the order of like 20 bytes or something, right? So these, these messages are small. All right, now, now that we know we know how to use Occam routing, let's see what that looks like if we want to create a secure channel over multiple transport layer hops. Um, so in this code example, I have a route to Bob, which is over two TCP hops. And then there is a local worker on a, a node that is two TCP hops away called Bob secure channel listener. And I take, that is my route to Bob. And then I have on line number eight, my secure channel create call, which as Alice, given the route to Bob, I am able to establish a secure channel with Bob by just calling this one line function. And what this will do is the moment I, I make this call, a handshake will be initiated over that multi-hop route, right? So the comparison with TLS is here, here is that in case of TLS, you wouldn't be able to do a end-to-end -end secure channel over these multiple TCP hops. Um, but in this scenario, we can, because our secure channel is decoupled from the transport layer connections by using this routing protocol, um, we can then establish this end-to-end -end secure channel. And then we can send messages through this channel. Um, this line number 10 is kind of interesting. So in line number 10, what we're saying, um, in line eight, what we got back was a address of the channel. So just like we had a printer address, we now have a local address for the channel. And when we write something to this local address, it gets encrypted. 
and gets sent over multiple hops to the other machine where it gets decrypted and is delivered to um, the local uh, the local node. So in terms of like a sequence diagram, this is what this looks like. Uh, you've got your app, which actually sends, uh, you know, uh, it says create a channel. So the channel initiator sends uh, over multiple hops. So you have hop one, hop two, hop three in the middle. Over multiple hops, it establishes a secure channel uh, with a secure channel listener. We can do this because we have the ability to route messages over multiple transport hops. And so once the secure channel setup is complete, uh, when we write a message to the channel initiator, it is encrypted. And then the encrypted messages are routed over the same multiple hops at the transport layer. And it's delivered to the channel responder on the other end, which decrypts it and sends it to some local worker that is multiple hops away. So this is at a very, very high level how we're able to achieve end-to-end -end encryption. And, and because I'm using the term end-to-end -end encryption here, I want to highlight that even though it's very common to use the term end-to-end -end encryption, uh, it's important to realize that it's more than about confidentiality. A secure channel provides us not only a confidentiality guarantee, it also provides us a data integrity guarantee and an authentication guarantee. This is important because uh, oftentimes people will go, well, my data isn't quite confidential. It's okay if it's visible on the network. But secure channels are also our only tool in computer science to... Uh, to easily efficiently guarantee data integrity uh, because they combine uh, various cryptographic primitives that guarantee data integrity and, and authentication and confidentiality. So it's a package deal, right? So if you want to make sure that your data is not manipulated on its path from its source to its destination, uh, you need a secure channel primitive to do this efficiently. You could technically design a protocol based on signatures, but designing these protocols is hard and secure channels are a proven primitive. So for example, even though we're not using TLS, which is one of the most, most proven secure channel implementations, we're using another very highly proven secure channel implementation based on this framework called the noise protocol framework, uh, which has gone through several uh, security audits, et cetera. Okay. So the important point here is that a secure channel is not only just providing us confidentiality, because you know when you, you hear the term encryption, you think confidentiality, it's not just providing us confidentiality guarantee, it's providing us a data integrity uh, guarantee, which is critical um, in most systems. Like basically, if you don't have a data integrity guarantee, I would argue that maybe your data isn't um, reliable or dependable by any kind of business use case. All right, so let's try to take this, this basic primitive we just created of being able to establish end-to-end -end encryption and try and apply it to a few real-world scenarios. So uh, let's imagine that um, I have a heart rate monitor and I want to deliver um, heart rate readings to my phone. And I go out on runs, so I don't want to carry my phone with me when I'm carrying just my, you know, let's say my my smart watch that is doing heart rate readings. Um, so since I don't want to carry my phone, my watch is, is equipped with a SIM card and it can collect my heart rate readings. So the goal of our application is to deliver heart rate readings to that phone application. Um, so because there is no direct path between my, uh, my monitor and my phone application, I must go through some kind of web service. And this is very typical of most IoT systems. So um, the heart rate monitor sends a reading to a service. The service then forwards that reading uh, to the phone application. And if the phone is offline, the service can cache that data and later at some point in time, like asynchronously deliver the data to the heart rate application. Um, but what's important to note here is that the, the 
in most such use cases, the service is really just playing routing and caching functions, right? Um, so it didn't need to actually see the contents of the data, it just needed to route and cache the data. And if you use sort of the most um, industry best practice advice, you would use TLS in the first transport connection hop, and you would use TLS again in the second transport connection hop. And what that would mean is that your heart rate reading would start at 80 beats per minute here. It would become some encrypted uh, integrity check value on the wire, and then it would reach the service and it would become 80 beats per minute again, right? And then would enter the second transport layer connection. It would become a different encrypted um, uh, authenticated value and then get delivered to the phone. This is pretty much industry best practice. So if people who do all the hard work and establish not only TLS, but like mutual TLS, uh, which is painful to set up and complicated, even then you get a big massive weak point in your system that uh, is unnecessary. It violates the principle of least privilege. My system was just supposed to deliver, um, deliver route and cache data, but it's now able to see and manipulate data which is not ideal. And in the design that we just looked at, um, uh, we um, can instead design an end-to-end -end encrypted secure channel uh, that looks like this. We still need the service because there's no internet route uh, directly between the monitor and the heart rate application, uh, but we can have these end-to-end -end encrypted uh, connections. This design is very similar to Signal or WhatsApp's end-to-end -end encryption. To enable this, uh, there are some com complications that I kind of glossed over and didn't touch on the, the simple code examples. But essentially, oftentimes these two devices, the phone and the heart rate monitor may be behind a, 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 a NAT. Uh, so you can't, um, you can't just make a TCP connection to the phone. The, the phone isn't even listening on a TCP server, right? So the phone has to initiate a TCP connection to the service. Um, to do enable that, because the Occam routing layer can route to local addresses like the printer, uh, it can also route to a remote mailbox for the phone on the heart rate service. So the phone makes a connection with the heart rate service and says, hey, create a mailbox for me and to collect encrypted messages for me. So the service can now collect these encrypted messages. It could even store them in a storage area like Kafka or a database, and then later asynchronously deliver those messages to the heart rate application. And the end-to-end -end encryption is still maintained. All right, so once we have this design, turns out a lot of systems are designed like this. If you have a connected outlet in your home, and you have a phone application that can con remotely control that connected outlet. Um, your phone is kind of optional in most system designs. The, if the service is compromised, the service could completely independently, autonomously from your phone, just take turn your outlets on or off, right? Uh, that is a violation of the least privilege principle. Uh, the service should allow you to route messages to the outlet, but it shouldn't have control on the outlet. Um, with our end-to-end -end encrypted design, that can be achieved. Um, if you've got a connected lock, same thing. Uh, the service doesn't need ability to control the data and spoof your identity. If you've got a connected doorbell, this one is a big one. Uh, there is a popular vendor of a connected doorbell that now has turned, they, they sell us connected doorbells and they've turned that system into a, um, uh, into a, um, centralized surveillance system. There are a lot of articles about this. Um, this is very bad. A connected doorbell just needs to deliver end-to-end -end encrypted uh, video data outside my door to my, to my phone. It doesn't need to actually see the contents of the data. Um, that design is possible. A, if you look at you know, industrial uh, LP van deployments or smart city deployments, like say this is a project I was involved in uh, several years ago, to do citywide flood monitoring. Um, in those designs, um, there are multiple network intermediaries. And so you may have a third party vendor in the middle, you may have a LoRaWAN gateway in the middle, and those, you know, that little gateway that is sitting on a light pole shouldn't become a vulnerability point in your system, but with transport layer security or TLS, it does. 
Um, instead, if we have an end-to-end -end encrypted design, uh, those intermediary parties can be eliminated from um, our vulnerability surface. Similarly, if you look at real-world systems at scale, uh, this is, let's say, a building management system. Um, you'll notice that there are lots of such network intermediaries between the source of information and the end consumer of that information. Um, uh, this type, this is not a hypothetical design. This is very, very common in smart buildings and smart cities and uh, smart factories. Lots of vendors sending lots of different systems and your end design ends up looking like this where you have lots of different vulnerability points. And in this setup, it, it gets so complex and the attack surface becomes so unmanageable that security is pretty much untenable, right? We can't secure this. It's too, com too widely open, right? To control this, we have to close all doors and then selectively open access. Uh, to do that, we have to do end-to-end -end encrypted communication. All right, to conclude, um, Occam is a Elixir, Elixir and Rustlang library today. Uh, it will have lots of implementations in multiple languages in the future, um, but this library provides a suite of cryptographic protocols that have been written to be environment independent. Uh, so secure channels and application layer routing are two key components, uh, but we're also doing things like lifecycle management of keys, uh, enrollment of a large fleet of devices, management of uh, API token leases, uh, or turning an API token into a leased managed short-lived token. So collection of these um, security type protocols that manage keys, credentials, and secure communication uh, and provide you with granularly authenticated and authorized uh, systems uh, that are end-to-end -end secure um, is what we're building at Occam. The system is 100% open, open source. And um, uh, we are always looking for contributions and use case ideas. And um, so if you're interested, please check out Occam on GitHub. Uh, that's the end of my talk. Thank you, everyone, for coming. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Marino. Um, I, have I, to, will be uh, on, I will be on yep. Toucan and on uh, chat for answer, to answer any questions or anything like that. Yeah. And, and there are three questions on the uh, questions on uh, Whova. And uh, um, since the time is limited, I'd like to pick one which is technical one. Uh, I read it, read it aloud. For encryption, uh, do you, Renal, prefer using Allen crypto module or using NIFS with Rust on Rust C? Oh, that's an excellent question. So I um, uh, I thought about that challenge quite a bit. Um, and in, in Occam, we ended up using a Rust, our Rust implementation. Um, the reason, there are pros and cons. The, in the, um, essentially the, the pros uh, towards Rust uh, are around memory safety, et cetera. Uh, whereas Erlang actually relies on an underlying crypto engine. That crypto engine, if it is a Rust-based crypto engine, you could technically get a lot of those benefits, but I, I am not currently aware of a Rust-based crypto engine that is plugged into Erlang. Uh, currently what's plugged into Erlang is OpenSSL and OpenSSL is notoriously um, bad for several reasons. Uh, the primary one being that it is too, um, there's a term in the cryptography community called cryptographic agility and OpenSSL is too agile. It, it exposes all the options to you as a user. Uh, and unless you're an expert at cryptography, it is very easy to make choose the wrong options. Um, in Occam, for example, we have a very different philosophy, which is this idea popularized by a few Google cryptographers, which is this idea of a have, a, have only one joint and keep it well oiled. Essentially, we have only one set of cryptographic algorithms. We've chosen them very, very carefully. And our, all our focus is on making sure that those cryptographic algorithms are secure and safe instead of having 500 different combinations of cryptographic primitives that could be combined in 
uh, mostly broken combinations, but some good combinations, which is the open SSL philosophy. So that was sort of a non-answer, but essentially there are trade-offs, uh, but I feel like um, uh, Rust definitely has certain advantages when it comes to memory safety, which is a okay. big class of bugs. Okay, thank you very much for a uh, um, very uh, detailed explanation. Okay, so since the time is limited, it's already past uh, um, 3 p.m. So I would like to close this session. And yes, thank you all for joining the session. Please rate the talk and uh, give your comments to the organizer. Next session of track one will begin after break on 3, 10 p.m. CSD. And we'll have a session called Ask Me Anything about Moongoose IM. The conference organizer would like all participants to visit the sponsors booth for supporting the sponsors and exhibitors. You can also take part in the quiz and win books about programming. You can find the link in the additional resources or in community board of the Hoover system. So thank you very much, Marina, from joining from California. It's uh, 6 a.m. in California right now, and it's amazing to have a, such a hard, so, so, such a what, early bird participant and presenter from here, I'm from California. And thank you, thank you all the audience. So enjoy your conference. Thank you very much. Thank you.